Okay. So can you hear me? Testing? Someone has to open the has to go online. Alright. <laughs> yeah, you can go online. Exactly 11.30, right? Now it's 11.23, right? Alright. So another seven minutes. Okay. And I'm not okay with camera. <laughs> you know, if I say anything wrong, you know, everything is recorded there. <laughs>
Is it working? Yeah. Facebook live stream. So can you can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. I mean, like from the live stream. Can you listen to my voice? Yes. Yes. Okay. So another four minutes to go. <laughs> Started. All right, but I. I was thinking like we have to start exactly at 11.30 because, you know, some people they are late or what. They, they want to start on time. Any one of you here is a final year, final year student? No? No one? All of you are second year, first year, second year. So I guess I should start right now. Is it okay? Can I start? Is it 11.30? Yeah, now it's 11.30. Alright, so can you hear my voice over there? Yeah? Alright. Okay, so uh, a very good morning to everyone here. So I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have this uh, physics coffee talk with you guys. This is my first time. So uh, not forgetting those who are watching live stream on Facebook, if any one of you is out there. So uh, thanks for watching. So um, the title of my talk today is on quantum optics from fundamental concepts to applications. So the purpose of this coffee talk is to provide a little bit of exposure to the undergraduate students on the field of quantum optics uh, from a theoretical point of view. And uh, I'm not going to go too deep into the technical aspect of it. I just want to like to let you guys to have grab the fundamental concepts. So uh, I want to make this coffee talk into uh, sorry. <laughs> 
So I want to make this coffee talk into like some kind of discussion rather than a, a formal presentation. So uh, you are welcome to like raise up your hand and ask any questions. Okay. So I believe by now most of you know know me. Uh, I am Dr. Edmund Low. So in this semester, I'm teaching this uh, classical mechanics. Yeah. So to understand quantum optics, we first need to know the definition. So quantum optics can be broadly defined as a subject that deals with the optical phenomena that can only be explained by treating uh, light as a stream of photons rather than as a classical electromagnetic waves. So for those of you out there who do not know, who are not familiar with the concept of photons, uh, photons is like a discrete energy packet you know, that you can count. You know, so later on, we will go to this uh, photon counting experiment. Uh, so why is it necessary for us to treat light as a photon? So it turns out that there are a few optical phenomena that can only be explained if we see light as a stream of photons rather than as a classical wave obeying the Maxwell equations. So, uh, but however, uh, most of the optical phenomena can actually be explained by what we call it as a semi-classical approach. So that does not require the, the photon picture of light. So why do I call it as a semi-classical instead of classical? So semi-classical actually, uh, so you need to understand that when we study light, like for example, we try to detect light and study the properties of light, we are actually studying the interaction between light and matter, like atoms or molecules. Because the detector that we use is made up of atoms and molecules that interact with the light. So we are actually studying the interaction between light and molecules and the atoms and molecules. So what happened here in this semi-classical approach is that we see the atoms and molecules as a quantum particle, applying the quantum mechanics to describe it. So we get like a discrete energy level. But for the light, normally we see as a classical wave. So this is a semi-classical approach. So it turns out that many optical phenomena like absorption, emission, reflection, refraction, transmission through a medium can actually be easily explained by what we call it as a semi-classical approach that doesn't require the uh, photon picture of light. Uh, of course, there are uh, relatively few optical phenomena that requires quantum optics, such as the concept of spontaneous emission. You know, so I, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the concept of spontaneous emission. So in, the, in studying the interaction between light and atom, the simplest possible picture that we can imagine is the interaction between a single frequency light, monochromatic light, with a two-level atom, with the ground state and the excited state. You know, for those of you who have taken this atomic physics or quantum mechanics, you know that uh, the, the energy describing an atom is discrete. So the simplest possible picture that I can figure out is the two-level atom with the ground state and excited state. So there are actually three processes uh, that we can that we have found experimentally. One is called as the stimulated absorption, or just the absorption. So initially, the atom is at the ground state. When you apply a, a light of frequency that matches the frequency between the transition frequency between the ground state and the excited state, what happens is that the atom will absorb the light and be promoted to the excited state. That's all. So the second process would be the stimulated emission. So, in it, so previously, initially, the, in the absorption process, the atom is at the ground state. So now in stimulated emission, initially the atom is at the excited state. So you have applied a uh, EM wave, which have the frequency that matches the transition frequency, so the atom will just go to the ground state. So in that process, it will release another photon, which carry the same characteristic as the incident wave. So it's like you produce a, another photon from, from to one photon. So the similarity between the absorption and the stimulated emission process is that it requires an incident electromagnetic wave. So there is a third process that can only be explained by quantum optics. We call it as a spontaneous emission. So the difference between spontaneous emission and the previous two processes that I have mentioned is that it does not require an incident light. So initially, the, the quantum particle or the atoms is at the excited state. It will just go to the ground state without being excited, I mean, without any incident wave in the incident electric, electromagnetic field, and it will release a photon. So this process can only be explained by quantum optics. So of course, I mean, the, the first question is like, what has spontaneous emission got to do with the photon picture of light? 
So it turns out that quantum optics actually predict what we call it as the vacuum fluctuations, the vacuum energy fluctuations that you get from solving the uh, quantum harmon harmonic oscillator from the Schrodinger equation. So by solving that, you will actually find out this uh, zero point energy. We call it as the vacuum fluctuations. So vacuum means like empty. You know, when you have a space which is completely empty, no atoms, no molecules, not even any electromagnetic wave. The vacuum is not really empty. This is the, you know, what we learn from quantum optics. The vacuum actually put, has some, what we call it as the vacuum fluctuations. You know, maybe we are not able to detect it, but we are able to see, see the effects of these vacuum fluctuations on the quantum system. So this is spontaneous emission. So spontaneous emission is nothing but uh, emission stimulated by the interaction between the vacuum fluctuations, the vacuum energy, and the quantum system. So it's actually it's a stimulated emission process. It's just that the incident light is not the electromagnetic field that we can generate. It's uh, vacuum fluctuations that exist in nature. So another process we, that can, another optical phenomenon that can be explained by quantum optics, only by quantum optics, is the lamp shift. So the lamp shift, lamp is L-A-M-B, you know. The lamp shift uh, is, uh, can also be explained, can, can also be explained by these uh, vacuum fluctuations. So if you learn this uh, atomic physics, you remember we actually have this uh, atomic orbital. The electrons will occupy this orbital, SPDF. So if you solve the Dirac equation for the hydrogen atom, you will realize that this uh, 2s half and 2p half orbital are supposed to be at the same energy level. So what happened experimentally, they observed that this uh, 2s half is slightly higher than this 2p half orbital. So at that time, they were not able to explain this theoretically because from the equation that is available at that time, they, they, they realized that, that both levels are supposed to be at the same energy level. Uh, so what happened is that uh, theoretically, we can actually resolve this issue by also taking into account the vacuum fluctuations as predicted by the quantum optics. Another one is Casimir effect, also due to vacuum fluctuations. Casimir effect there, if you have a two parallel conducting mirror close to one another, very close to one another, uh, there will be an attractive force that will attract these two parallel conducting plates together. This is the Casimir effect, also caused by the vacuum fluctuations. And another one is the laser line wave. Yeah, so uh, we know that when we say that the, this laser is at a particular wavelength or frequency, like 600 nanometer, uh, what we mean is that the average frequency that we can get from the laser is that value, average frequency or average wavelength. So line wave is the concept that, you know, the, there is this distribution of frequency actually that accompany the laser. So uh, this laser line wave is actually caused by the spontaneous emission that I have mentioned just now. Okay, at least this is what we know from quantum optics. Another one would be the non-classical photons, non-classical light. So we will go, we will visit this uh, concept of non-classical light later when we talk about photon statistics and this uh, second order correlation function. So anyway, uh, uh, semi-classical theory is enough to explain many phenomena in laser spectroscopy, you know. Uh, so it is quite hard for us to observe uh, quantum optics in experiment, actually. So the development of quantum optics is, I would say quantum optics is as old as quantum theory itself. Because the first study of quantum theory is on what? Anyone can tell me? What is the first? How, how did quantum theory ever start? For the electric. For the electric. So before that, actually, uh, Max Planck already studied this black body radiation. So the study of black body radiation actually marks the beginning of this quantum optics. Because anyway, black body radiation is nothing but the thermal light, thermal light emitted by a hot body and a hot object. So actually, quantum optics started from there. So the first experimental demonstration of quantum optics actually start, is in 1977, you know, by this group uh, led by Kimball, Dagonias, and Mandel, where they have successfully demonstrated a, a non-classical property of light. We call it as a photon anti-bunching, meaning that the photon you know, if, if you visualize light as a stream of particles rather than as a wave, the photons are equally separated in time interval. The time separation between the successive photons is the same, equal. It's a very regular photon stream. So this is only predicted in quantum optics and not in uh, classical optics, not even from uh, Maxwell equation. 
So this prediction, uh, they, they predicted this theoretically, and later in 1977, it has been successfully generated. And from that time on, more and more groups, research groups all around the world, they have generated this uh, non-classical light using different, different systems. So today, it, generating non-classical light is like a normal thing. <laughs> you know, you won't get a Nobel Prize for that anymore. Uh, it, has, it has some, it's something that has already been done many times. So the, this is, I would say, the first confirmation that the theoretical prediction in quantum optics is accurate. So later on, um, many other crazy stuff has been done. The generation of squeeze light, you know, later on we will go to that squeeze light. Uh, generation of single photons, uh, application of quantum optics in quantum information, quantum cryptography, uh, the Bose-Einstein condensation of atoms, atom laser, you know why is atom laser? So you know that laser uses light. Atom laser is like a, a coherent atomic beam, like atom that behaves like a wave, you know. Instead of using light, you use atom. A and that atom, the atomic wave, uh, has this uh, coherent property, coherent something like a laser, you know, this atom laser. So this is done in 1997. And they, I think they have done this quantum teleportation. I think recently we heard that China has, that has done this uh, teleportation as well, right? Photon, I'm not sure about that. This is a recent thing. So, so enough with the development. So, um, so let's go back to the, what we learned in quantum mechanics. So we know that in classical optics, the electric and magnetic field are described by the so-called Maxwell equations. So in quantum optics, where we see the photon and uh, we see the light as a stream of photons, we need to have a quantum mechanical description of this electric and magnetic field. So in quantum mechanics, uh, we have a special name for physical quantity, you know, like electric and magnetic field. Uh, what, what, what other physical quantities that you can think of? Any examples? Physical quantities? Those in my class, you know what is physical quantities? Remember? Yeah, any quantities that can be measured, okay? Kinetic energy, potential energy, velocity, acceleration, all these are physical quantities. So in quantum mechanics, we have a special name for these quantities. We call it as observables. So all observables in quantum mechanics must be represented by a Hermitian operator. It must be an operator. So can you measure electric and magnetic field? In, in the experiment, yes, you can do that. So in quantum mechanics, you have to express electric and magnetic field as an operator, not as a function, not just as a function of time and space. Okay, so what happened is that the, the first thing you need to do to study quantum optics is to know how to quantize electromagnetic field. We need to express electric and magnetic field as an operator. So of course, we need to borrow the concept from this uh, Maxwell equation as well, and at the end, uh, you will arrive at an expression that the E and, and the magnetic field, H or B, will depend on this uh, operator. We call it as the creation and annihilation operator. So you know what is the meaning of annihilate? Annihilate means? Destroy. Destroy, yes. Uh, so creation and destruction operator. So this is the same operator that we use to study this uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. So what happened here is that, uh, do, do you still remember what you learned in your pre-university on this chapter on simple harmonic motion? So you learn about, uh, in pre-university, you learn about linear motion, you learn about this circular motion, and another very important thing is simple harmonic motion. So the, sim the simple harmonic motion that you learn in your pre-university is only applicable for a big system, you know, a microscopic system. But what happens if the electrons, protons, atoms, and molecules system, as small as that, uh, also perform simple harmonic motion? You can no longer use the concept you learned in your pre-university to, to study that. So you need to have a quantum version of simple harmonic motion. We call it as a quantum harmonic oscillator. So what happened here is that we actually borrow the idea from the solution of quantum harmonic oscillator and apply it to the electromagnetic field. And we get an expression of this uh, electric and magnetic operator. Okay, so in solving for the quantum harmonic oscillator, we, you know, we try to solve the Schrodinger equation. Solving Schrodinger equation meaning that we want to find out the wave function that describes the quantum harmonic oscillator. So if you still remember what you learned in your simple harmonic oscillator, the potential energy is, what is the, well, what is the expression for potential energy? 
for a simple harmonic oscillator that obeys a Hooke's law. Imagine you have a wall and then you have a block on a horizontal surface and you have a spring attached to it. Half? Yes, half kx squared. So we're going to use that. So in Schrodinger equation, you know what is the kinetic energy? Negative h bar squared over 2m and then the second derivative in space uh, plus with the potential energy. So what is the potential energy here? The thing that you mentioned just now, half kx squared. K is nothing but m omega squared, right? Okay, so we're going to substitute that into the Schrodinger equation. We solve the Schrodinger equation and then we... Well, there are actually two solutions. Not to say two solutions, uh, I mean like two methods of solving it. One is called a series method where you will end up with a wave function with the, we call it as a Hermite polynomial, a special function. And another way of solving it is what we call it as the operator method, where we use the creation and destruction operator that I mentioned just now. So uh, though, though this operator method is a more popular one because we are going to use it in somewhere else, not just in solving this uh, quantum harmonic oscillator, we are going to use it again and again to define what we call it as a photon number state. Uh, so for now, you just remember that the electric and magnetic field in operator form is expressed in terms of this creation and destruction operator. So by solving this quantum harmonic oscillator, you will end up with a solution where the lowest possible energy is not zero. It's half h bar omega. This is the lower. And this is what we call it as the energy of the vacuum fluctuation. So by solving the Schrodinger equation describing a quantum harmonic oscillator, we get a completely different result from what we get in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, the, what is the minimum energy? Zero. As long as the thing is not moving, it's zero. Uh, but in quantum harmonic oscillator, no. There is still energy there. The lowest possible energy is half h bar omega. So if you want to get a, another, a, a higher energy, there's one plus half h bar omega. A second higher energy, two plus half h bar omega. That's all you get. So at the end, you will end up with uh, many solutions. I would say in the, I mean, like psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, which can be represented in the ladder form, the ladder operator. So this uh, so-called creation operator actually promote, like, you know, increase the level, and the destruction operator will just decrease the level. Uh, so now we will go to this uh, classi classification of light by photon statistics. So uh, we actually classify light according to the uh, so-called photon statistic. So to understand photon statistic, uh, you need to understand what we call it as the uh, photon counting experiment. Okay, count the number of photons or the photon detection experiment. So in this experiment, we have this uh, photo detector. We call it as a photo multiplier tube. You know, which is attached to a electronic counter that will count the electrical pulses re re received from this uh, photo multiplier tube and. What happened here is that the intensity of beam that we want to study must be low enough. So we have a low intensity beam, photon multiplier tube, and an electronic counter. Of course, the real setup will be much more complicated than that, but to answer, understand the concept, that's all you need. So the low intensity beam must be very low. Uh, what happened here is that uh, we don't want to saturate the detector with too many photons. That's why we use an extremely low intensity beam. So we always remember that in quantum optics, uh, that there is a correspondence between the classical optic and quantum optic. The number of photons is actually the intensity. The more number of photons you get, the higher the intensity. Okay, this is the correspondence between classical and quantum optics. So what happened here is that in the photon, photon counting experiment, we want, to have, we want to count one photon at a time. We don't want to saturate the detector with too many photons at one time. In that case, you will get, not get an accurate result. We want to be as accurate as possible. So what happened is that this photon counting experiment, what we are trying to achieve is that we want to count the number of photons that we can get in a specific time interval, like in one nanosecond, how many photons I can get. Uh, so the, the time is de decided by the user himself. So what happened here is that now let's imagine you have a low intensity beam from a typical helium neon laser. You can easily get it anyway, helium neon laser and then with uh, operating at 633 nanometer around, around that. And it has a power of around one milliwatt. And we try to reduce the power down to 
one nanowatt by using these optical filters, many, many optical filters, to attenuate the beam. So that it will decrease, 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 the power will be left with around one nano, nanowatt. So imagine that, so if you, uh, what, what is the speed of light? What is the value of speed of light? Three? Yeah, three to the power of eight meter per second. Okay, so using that information, together with the information that I provided just now about the power of the light, you can calculate that within one nanosecond, you can get on the average like around three photons from the experiment. This is what we get from calculation. But when we perform the experiment, we realize that it's much more complicated than that. So what happened is that in the first nanosecond, I get two photons. Second nanosecond, I get one photon. Third nanosecond, I get six photons. So different measurement, like different measurement performed, you get a different number. But on the average, you get three. So what happened is that we realized that the detection of photon is random. You know? So in this case, we are trying to, okay, so what you can do here, you can actually record down the data, like first number, second, how, how many photons you get, and then you can tabulate it. You, you write it in the table. So the first row of the table will be the number of photon n. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, to the maximum photon that you can get. And the second row will be the frequency. Frequency means how many times have you gotten 0 photon? Uh, maybe 5 times, you just write 5. How many times have you gotten 1 photon? 3 times, I just write down. So at the end, and then the third row, you can calculate the probability of getting uh, each photon result, photon number result. Like for example, for 0 photon, you get the probability of, okay, maybe you get 5 times out of 100 times, so 5 divided by 100, you get a probability. And then you can actually plot out, plot out the diagram, plot out the distribution with the vertical axis as a probability for detecting each number of photon and the horizontal axis as a number of photon. So at the end you will get a distribution, like a normal distribution like that. So this is called photon statistic. This is the photon statistic. So what happened is that we can actually generally uh, classify this photon statistic into three categories. Oh yeah, so for the working principle of this photomultiplier tube, what happens is that when the light reaches the photomultiplier tube, it will trigger a release of uh, many, many electrons. Uh, so the electrons must be significantly large in such a way that it can be detected as an electrical pulse by the electronic counter. Once the electronic counter register, register the electrical pulse, it will count as one photon. Uh, this is how it works. So what happens is that we can actually uh, so remember what you learned in the statistics, uh, Poissonian statistics, that the variance equals to the mean number of the mean. So if you get this kind of distribution, Poissonian distribution, uh, this light, it can be, we call it as a coherent light. Coherent light that you can get from a laser. Coherent monochromatic beam with the constant electric intensity. If you have a laser beam, where every point in space and any time you measure, the intensity is constant, you will get, uh, and you perform this uh, photon counting experiment, you will get this uh, Poissonian distribution. Okay, so, and so this Poissonian statistic actually provides as a benchmark, you know, that can help us to classify another types, other two types of photon. So another type of photon is the super Poissonian, it's a, it's a light that obeys what we call it as a super Poissonian statistics where the, mean, the variance is higher than the mean. It's much greater than the mean. The, the, the variance of the number of photons is, uh, for the number is uh, greater than the mean photon number. So if you get this kind of light, we call it as a super Poissonian light. Examples of such a light is thermal light. You get from a black body radiation. This is an example, you know. And another example would be the chaotic light. You get from a discharge lamp, you know. Uh, so what happened in graphically, you can, if this is a Poissonian distribution, super Poissonian distribution will be a much broader one. Yeah, so we can say that super Poissonian, super Poissonian light is actually less stable compared to Poissonian light. So classically speaking, Poissonian light is the most stable kind of light that we can get. That is what we came up from the laser source, you know. But of course, this statistic, uh, I mean, this photon statistic concept actually come up with a third category, which is the non-classical property of light. We call it as a sub-Poissonian light. So graphically speaking, sub-Poissonian light has an even narrower width compared to the Poissonian, Poissonian case.
Uh, so in this case, the variance is lesser compared to the mean. So what happened is that this is the prediction that we can get. Remember how, how did we how, how did we start all this? We started all this by seeing light as a stream of photons, not as a wave. And that's why we arrived at these three categories of photon statistics. So this sub Poissonian light can only be predicted if we see light as a stream of photons. So in other words, this is a prediction by quantum optics. So if you are able to generate light in the laboratory that obey these sub Poissonian statistics, then we can prove that the photon picture of light is true and is acceptable. So it turns out that, mm, it turns out that uh, I think in the year 1985, uh, there's this group, I don't know where they come from, they have successfully generated such a uh, sub Poissonian light. Okay, so like, this is happening in 1985. Today is a very common thing, you know, you can easily generate light. With, that obeys this uh, sub Poissonian uh, uh, photon statistics. So, the concept they use is that they try to use a discharge lamp. You know, a discharge lamp is like you try to excite the atoms within the discharge lamp with the electrons. So, they try to control the electrons in such a way that they can obey the sub Poissonian statistics so that the light generated from the discharge lamp also obeys sub Poissonian statistics. So, it turns out that they have successfully generated this light. So I'm not going to go into the technical details. If you want to know more, you can come to me, no problem. So of course, the classification of light by photon statistic is just one, like, just one aspect. There is another classification of light by what we call it as the, based on the second order correlation function. So um, what happened is that, so we have first order correlation function and second order correlation function. In the first order correlation function, uh, we actually study the, how to say, um, the correlation between electric field at different times. You know, we want to see the, how stable is the phase of the wave. How stable is the phase of So the first order correlation function actually quantify that. The second order correlation function is to study the correlation between intensities at two different times. You know, so this concept actually already existed in classical optics long time ago, but we have a quantum version of it. So remember what I mentioned just now that intensity is related to the number of photons. The more number of photons you have, the higher the intensity. So if I if I claim that second order correlation is uh, is used to quantify the correlation of intensity at two different times, I also uh, what I mean is that in quantum optics term. Second order correlation function is to quantify the correlation between the number of photons at two different times. So uh, what do we mean by correlation? We want to know that how, how much they are related to one another. How, like, if I have an intensity at time t, and I have another intensity at time t plus tau, where tau is the time delay, so I want to see like, how stable is the intensity, how, how constant is the intensity over time. So if you uh, calculate the second order correlation function for a coherent light, perfectly coherent light from a laser source, you will get the value of 1 at all times, at all time delay, because it's constant. You know, intensity is constant. I assume that I have an idealized laser, you know, that the intensity always remains constant over time. So I will get a value of 1. If I try to calculate the second order correlation function for a chaotic light, chaotic light meaning sub super Poissonian type, like thermal light, you know, light that you get, partially coherent light that you get from a discharge lamp, you will get a second order correlation function that will decay over time. Like if I plot the graph of uh, G2, second order correlation function versus time delay, the tau, you will get a graph like this. And it will stop at this, I mean, it will remain constant at one at later time. So how to interpret the result? Okay, so remember, I mentioned that G2, second order correlation function, is nothing but the correlation between the number of photons. So we actually set up this uh, Hanbury brown twist experiment. You know, it's a photon counting experiment as well. That could, uh, tells, tells us that, you know, what is the probability of uh, detecting two photons separated by a specific time interval. Okay, like after I detect one photon, how long I need to wait to detect another photon, you know? So of course, the, because the process is random, 
something like a Geiger counter that you learn you learn on nuclear physics, you know Geiger counter. Collect the part yeah, gamma particles, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so it's the same thing over here. Uh, the process is random, you get different results. Again you can draw the you can tabulate the data and draw a distribution of it. You know, you can get this result. Okay. So this is what so what what is the meaning here? I get the G two and as I have a G2 as a vertical axis and tau as a, the time delay as a horizontal axis, and I get a graph like this. What I'm, what, how I can interpret the result is that the probability of detecting two photons at the same time is higher than the probability of detecting two photons separated by a time interval, because this is zero. Remember, tau is the time delay. How the separation, the time separation between the two successive photons. If I have a higher peak here, meaning the probability of detecting two photons at the same time is higher than the probability of detecting two photons separated by a time interval. This is for chaotic light. So of course, again, quantum optic predict another type of light where so we have G two always equals to one. This is the first. This is the coherent light. G two. Uh, more than one at the initial time. This is for chaotic light. So of course, naturally, the third category would be G2 at zero time equals to what? less than one. So that is what we call it as a non-classical light, another non-classical light. So if you try to force the photon picture into this, to, to explain this phenomena, you will end up with three different categories of light. Uh, so the one that the one, the coherent light, we just call it as a coherent one. And the chaotic light, we call it as a bunch, bunch light. Why bunch? Because the photons are stick to one another. They are stick to one another. So what happened is that when you carry out the, the photon detection experiment, the two photon, the, it's, very like, it's more likely for you to detect two photons at the same time than for you to detect two photons separated by a time interval because all the, the photons are together. <laughs> You know, bunch together. So this is the type of light that we can get from maybe fluorescent lamp. You know, the light that you can easily get from anywhere. Why? Because there are so many atoms and, and emitting light inside the fluorescent lamp. So all of them, you know, randomly emit. Definitely, you, I mean, you, the probability of two atoms emitting photon at the same time will be high. So of course, you will get a bunch light. So if you have a non-classical light, where the G two at time tau equals to zero, less than one, the probability of detecting two photons together is very low. We call this as an anti-bunch light. That means the two successive photons are separated by a time interval, and the time interval is regular. That means first photon, second photon, and third photon, they are both separated by the same time interval. You know, this is what we call it as a photon anti-bunching. Bunch means together. Anti-bunching means separated. So we call it as a photon anti-bunching. So again, uh, photo anti-bunching is a prediction that we get from quantum optic. If we are able to generate such a light, then we can prove that quantum optic is reliable. We can actually, yeah. When you say it's bunch or anti-bunch? Uh, it's in the middle between the two. It's coherent. <laughs> uh, not really quantum. Yeah, laser is the most stable type of light we can get from classical optics. Yeah. So quantum optic actually predict a more stable light than the coherent light. We call it as an anti-bunch light, or non-classical light. So uh, theoretically speaking, a research, a researcher in quantum optics will be obsessed with finding out non-classical light. You know, he will do all sorts of calculations, and do simulation, and, and prove that the, the system that he is studying actually generates such a non-classical light. You know? uh, this is uh, in, in, in theore research in theoretical quantum optics. So, so far, have anyone found photo anti-bunching? Okay, yeah, I, I think I already mentioned that at the beginning of the talk. I mentioned that there is this group led by Kimball, Dagonias, and Mandel. You know, they have successfully generated this uh, light which exhibit this photon anti-bunching in the year 1977, long time ago, even earlier than this uh, sub poissonian statistics. Huh? So the recipe that they are using is they try to isolate the photo emissive, emissive source. Like, uh, they try to get light emitted by a single atom. Okay, mm -hmm. the case, in, in the experiment, they use, they use this sodium atom. 
of course, uh, sodium atom is not the only atom possible. Okay, many atoms are possible. As long as you have this uh, incident light that matches the frequency of the transition frequency, you can you can use that. So they use a sodium beam. Sodium beam mean, meaning that the atomic beam. You know, they try to get uh, this uh, single atom and collect the light emitted by a single atom, and then try to carry out this uh, Hanbury Brown twist experiment to measure the second order correlation. And it turns out that the result was quite. Im Quite impressive at that time. Now it's not impressive anymore. Now we can we can do better than them. Uh, I'm not sure how they get it. They should get a zero value at time tau equals to zero, but they get zero point something, which is not bad. You know, still lesser than one. So okay. So that is the proof that uh, quantum optic. In fact, that is the first proof that quantum optic is uh, reliable. The theory in quantum optics is acceptable. You know, and then later on, uh, photo antibunching has been generated by many other research labs all around the world. So today, generating photo antibunching light is a uh, common place. You won't get a Nobel Prize for that again. <laughs> okay, so uh, so what can we learn from this photo antibunching? What is the application of knowing this uh, photo antibunching? Actually, um, is actually in this uh, generation of single photon sources. So if we are able to uh, produce light that are equally spaced in time interval, we can actually collect one photon at a time, which is extremely difficult, but it's possible. And in fact, they have generated these single photon sources. So what is the use of this single photon source? Why, why do we need a single photon? Well, it is to carry out quantum information processing. So today, I think quantum information is one of the most heavily researched area in Singapore and USA, Japan. I think they are doing a pretty good job as well. You know, so what happened is that they try to uh, use manipulate photon to store information. You know, the storing of information in photon. They can also choose to store it in the atomic example and retrieve the information by having this emission process. Absorption is like you store the information into an atom, and emission is like you read the information, you take out the information, like your thumb drive. You know, you store it, you're safe, and then you want to retrieve it, you just open it up. Yeah, so it's like saving is like absorption, absorb. And then retrieving it is like reading, okay? It's like emission. So, so we have learned about uh, the two different classification of light based on first based on this uh, photon statistic, secondly based on second order correlation function. So now we shall see how can we express this. Uh, I mean, mathematically speaking, you know, like the state of the photon itself. So now I'm going to talk about the different states of radiation field from a quantum optics point of view. So we have this Fox state of photon number state by the number of photon in the in the photon in the light system. So what happened here is that I just borrowed the idea from quantum harmonic oscillator because I believe that photons is nothing but a quantum harmonic oscillator. So after all, photons can never be seen as separated from wave phenomena. It's still oscillating. You know? So at the end, I can just borrow the idea from quantum harmonic oscillator solution and apply it to uh, and define uh, what we call it as a photon number states. So how does a photon number states look like? So remember I mentioned about this photon counting experiment. Every measurement you get a different number of photon. And then at the end you get the mean. If you try to calculate the mean of number of photon, you will, you will get the same value as you can get from a classical calculation. So what happened here is if you have, a f if you have generated a photon number states like of two photons, for example, I use the cat notation two, you know, bracket notation two. So what happened is that if I perform a photon counting experiment, I should expect that every measurement will give me two photons. It will not be random. Uh, of course, this is a highly idealized case. Uh, so far, no one has done this before. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the experiment that we performed, it, I mean, like, people performed was quite close to this state, but uh, not exactly. You know, sometimes they will get fluctuation in the in the photon number results. So, uh, so this is only idealization in mathematical terms. So another state we call it as a coherent state. I think uh, 
measure the evaluation of two because of the way how you prepare the system. If you go with the prepare the system in such a way that it's on the pure state, that's yeah. why you have a issue. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, practication and preparation. Yeah, and also some optical losses also take into account. Optical losses is very important. Mm. So um, another one is the coherent state. Uh, so actually, in I mean, we can es express the so-called coherent state in quantum. I mean, it, as a quantum state. You know, in quantum mechanics, we express this. Uh, we call it as uh, what we call it state vector. We have a state vector that describes a quantum system, and we try to solve it from the Schrodinger equation and retrieve the information by uh, getting this uh, quantum mechanical average. You know, so what happened is that uh, there is a mathematical expression we call it as a coherent state, which is a quantum mechanical equivalent of a classical coherent field. You know, so. This uh, mathematically, if you look at the mathematics, is nothing but the linear superposition of a photon number state, you know, which is which makes sense, right? Because from the photon counting experiment, we get different different result at different time. So yeah, it should be a linear superposition of uh, all the possible uh, photon number states. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to show you the mathematics because you know that's not the point of this coffee talk. And we have squeeze state as well. So what you learn in your quantum mechanics is that there is this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, remember? So it's like, can you give me an example of Heisenberg uncertainty principle, position and momentum? How are the uncertainty in position and momentum related to one another? H bar over two. Yeah, H bar. It must be more than or equals to H bar over two. You know. So if you, in coherent state, uh, the more sign, the more than, the greater than sign doesn't apply. It's the equal sign that apply. Uh, so this is coherent state. We call it as a minimum uncertainty state. So in the squeeze state, what happened is that uh, I try to decrease the uncertainty in one variable at the expense of another variable. You know, in such a way that it will still obey the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Not that because I, I like uncertainty relation a lot. We don't like it actually. We try to reduce the uncertainty as much as possible. But the uncertainty relation is a, a law of nature, an intrinsic thing, uh, some, a, a, a law that applies to all quantum system. So the only way you can, like for example, if I have an electromagnetic wave. The two complementary variable will be the amplitude and the phase of the electric field. So what I'm trying to do is, I, I want to re if I want to reduce the uncertainty in amplitude, naturally I will increase the uncertainty in the phase. If I try to in decrease the uncertainty in the phase, I will increase the uncertainty in the amplitude. You know, it's complementary. Okay, it's I, 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 Okay, so. Um, so have they generated such a light? Yes, uh, they have generated such a light many places in different quantum optical system. So next I'm going to talk about, all right, so as I mentioned earlier, that when we talk about studying light, we're actually studying the interaction between light and metal, you know, electromagnetic field and atoms and molecules. So mm, in quantum optics, they actually mm, mathematically solve for uh, this problem of light matter interaction. So actually, there are three approaches to solving light matter interaction. So outside of quantum optics, we have this uh, classical way, you know, where we treat both the light and the atom as a classical object. So light is a classical object, meaning it's a wave that obeys this Maxwell equation. For the metal or the atom, uh, it can be viewed as a dipole, uh, Hertzian, what we call it, Hertzian dipole, yeah, as a Hertzian dipole you know, oscillating dipole. So this is the classical, the fully classical way of solving this light matter interaction. It has been solved a long time ago. So within quantum optics, there is this uh, semi-classical method, which I mentioned just now, where only the atom is seen as a quantum mechanical particle, quantum mechanical system, where the light is uh, remain as a classical wave. So the third approach will be the quantum approach, uh, where both the light and the metal, the, the atom, are seen as a quantum object. 
So the light will be seen as a stream of photons represented by this operator form of the electric and magnetic field, operator form. You know? So the formalism is very complicated. Uh, so in semi-classical theory, there are uh, different ways of solving. You know? Of course, we will still need to use the Schrodinger equation because the, the atom is a quantum particle. Uh, there is this probability amplitude method, interaction picture method, density operator method. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the concept of density op operator. Density operator. Are you familiar with the concept? No, it's not. <laughs> okay. So in the last chapter. Oh, okay. So then, okay, so there are different ways of uh, representing a quantum system. The one that you guys are familiar with will be the state vector or the wave function. You know, wave function is actually related to the state vector. So another way is the density operator. You know, we use the density operator to represent a quantum system. So what is the benefit of representing using this density operator instead of this uh, uh, state vector? So actually, uh, if you express this... Um, quantum system using the density operator, you can actually take into account what we call it as the dissipation or relaxation, you know, in the theory of open quantum system. Okay, but there's no point of me showing you the max. So uh, this is just for your understanding. So what happened here is that in the quantum update, we, if we use this semi-classical approach to solve this light matter interaction, we will arrive at, we will observe a peculiar Phenomena we call it as a rabbi oscillation, where the quantum system, like for example an atom, will actually oscillate back and forth between the excited state and ground state, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, but this is uh, very hard to observe in experiment. Anyway, somebody somebody actually observe it. You know, uh, you need to be very fast. You know, I mean the the, the time interval had to be small enough to observe this effect, the rabbi oscillation. Uh, so another very important, also if you use the fully quantum mechanical way to solve it, you will get another phenomena, uh, which is complementary to the previous one. We call it as a collapse and revival, you know, very much like uh, envelope. You know, if you, if you plot out the quantity called inversion, which is nothing but the probability for the atom to be in excited state, minus the probability for the atom to be in a lower state, uh, you will see this effect. You will see the graph is like an envelope of a wave. So what happened? Uh, yeah, another important thing is there are three different picture of representation in quantum in quantum mechanics, not just in quantum optics. So first is called the Heisenberg picture, where okay. So the, I I know you guys are familiar with the Schrödinger picture, where it is the state vector or the wave function that is time dependent and the operator. The, which represent the observable is time independent. So in the Heisenberg picture, they go the opposite way. It is the operator that is time dependent, while the state vector is time independent. So and then we have the combination of both, which is the most common one. We call it as an interaction picture. Normally in quantum optics, we use interaction picture because it can greatly simplify the, the calculation, uh, where the, both the state vector and the operator depends on time. So there is actually a mathematical relation that can relate the operator and state vector in three different picture of representation. You can just jump back and forth, uh, whichever, whichever can help you to solve the, uh, the, the problem easily. So, yeah, I think I still have another 10 minutes. So now I would like to go to the application of quantum optics. So of course, the one, one of the most obvious application, of course, is in the field of quantum information. You know, if I can manipulate single photons, I should, in principle, be able to use it as a medium where I can store and retrieve quantum information. You know, this is one of the. Uh, of course, uh, so another famous application, of course, is in the spectroscopy lah. So now I will talk a little bit about spectroscopy. So what happened is that in spectroscopy, most of the process need not a photon representation of light. You know, most of it can be uh, explained by semi-classical approach. But anyway, uh, semi-classical approach is also a part of quantum optics because before there was quantum optics, uh, people only 
study everything in a classical terms. You know, atom is also an oscillating dipole. That's it. That's all they got. So um, spectroscopy can be broadly defined as the study of interaction between light and matter. Matter can be atoms, molecules, and ions, and the interpretation of the signal it produces from the interaction. So in a typical spectroscopy experiment is that you have a system that you want to study. You have a molecular sample. You shine a laser light on it, and then the light emitted after the interaction will be collected or measured by a spectrometer, where you can get the spectra. You know, and the spectra can give us a lot of information regarding the sample, such as the uh, chemical composition, what type of molecular species is present in the sample, the molecular structures and the properties, uh, the, the how to say the bond strength, the bond angles. You know, how does the molecule within the sample looks like, and it can also tell us about the physical property of the sample. For example, we learn about black body radiation. You know, so if you pull out this uh, radiation from a black body, you pull out the distribution for the energy density, you realize that it depends only on the temperature. You know, distribution depends on the temperature. So regardless of the chemical composition. So if you can, if you know which, I mean, what, what kind of wavelength of light you can get from the sample emitted by a hot body, then you can guess the temperature. You know, this is one of the many different physical properties that you can get. So example, uh, another example of this is, well, this is how we actually study the chemical composition and the velocities of uh, distant stars and nebulae, you know, the astronomical bodies. How do we study them without even going over there? How can we know so much about other galaxies, other stars, without even actually going there? So it turns out that actually we study the uh, microwave, you know, radio wave, you know, that is, that, that is constantly bombarding our atmosphere, the Earth atmosphere. We study them and then we, we can study a lot about other stars. Uh, so in fact, uh, researchers have identified more than 130 uh, interstellar molecules by studying the radio wave that uh, bombards our Earth atmosphere. So um, there are many different types of spectroscopy. So uh, if you, the lowest frequency of electromagnetic spectrum that we use here is the radio wave frequency, where it evolves, if you have a system that absorbs this radio wave frequency, normally it, it will evolve transition in the nuclear spin. You know, remember Zeeman effect? You apply a magnetic field, and then you can split the magnetic energy into this spin up, spin down. Yeah, the transition between the two usually is in the, way, in the range of uh, radio wave frequency. So this is type of, one type of spectroscopy. Another one is in the microwave range. You can get, uh, it will involve rotational transition. Okay, so what do I mean by rotational transition? So when we study atom, if you still remember what you study in your solution of hydrogen atom, uh, remember the Hamiltonian, we only involve the Hamiltonian describing the electron. So what happened to the nucleus? <laughs> what happened to the nucleus? What happened to the kinetic energy describing the nucleus? Uh, why, why is it that we don't include the nucleus in our uh, solution of Schrodinger equation? Uh, so actually the answer is because electron is much lighter and the, the, the total energy of the atom actually is dominated by the energy of the electron. Not that the, the nucleus doesn't have, it's just that we make an approximation that the motion of the nucleus is not as great as the electron. So we say that. So we call it as, so any transition between the two energy level that you learn in so solving the hydrogen atom is what we call it as an electronic transition. So it, this is only for a single atom. What if I have a molecule? You know, molecule, two atoms bond together. So in this case, we have two additional motion. We call it as a rotational motion and vibrational motion. Rotational, you know, rotational, <laughs> okay, and vibrational motion. So these two additional motion actually uh, increases the number of energy levels that we need to study. Uh, you can actually solve this by applying some approximation to the Schrodinger equation, and you can get this rotational and vibrational transition. So if we have two rotational energy level, the transition between the two will be usually involve frequency in the microwave range. Uh, so for vibrational transition, it will involve frequency usually in the infrared range. Yeah. So 
Uh, when we talk about vibrational spectroscopy, which usually occurs in the infrared range, uh, there are actually two major types of vibrational spectroscopy. One is the IR, the infrared, infrared spectroscopy, where we use the infrared laser, laser, infrared light to excite the transition. And another one is called as the Raman spectroscopy. So have you guys heard about Raman spectroscopy? No? So why is it? Only the name. Okay, great. So I'm going to explain this. So what happened is that I previously mentioned spectroscopy is all about absorption and emission. You absorb the light and then you emit it. And then we study, you know, from the spectrum. You know. So what happened is that in Raman spectroscopy, there is no absorption or emission involved. All we have is scattering, light scattering, scattering between photons. Uh, so, uh, so you can visualize it by seeing light as a photon again. You know, remember what you learned in your pre-university, you have collision. This Compton scattering, remember? Yes, something like Compton scattering. Yeah, so you have Compton scattering, uh, use it to visualize. So if we draw out the energy level diagram for, to describe Raman spectroscopy, the energy level is not the real level, it's the virtual level. Uh, it's a level that we sketch out to, in such a way that you know, the, the working principle will still obey the conservation of energy. Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, photon energy, uh, the, the virtual, uh, all we call it, we call it as a virtual energy level, it's not a real level. So the spectroscopy ob obtained from this, Ram the, the result obtained from this spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy is usually sharper, you can get a sharper spectrum, you know, better than the one. So it will provide a, a way for us to identify the molecular species in the sample. So if you have a light in the visible and UV region, uh, it will involve electronic transition, you know, which is the energy level that you get from your atom, electronic transition, UV and visible light, usually. Of course, there are some visible light that can be used in this uh, Raman spectroscopy as well, no problem. Uh, so, um, and then we have, so uh, electronic transition is a common thing. Any, anything that involves absorption and emission in daily life usually is in a range of uh, electronic transition. Uh, so if we have a light in an even higher frequency range, the highest possible that we have uh, in the UV and X-ray in between the two, what will happen? Can anyone guess what will happen to the atom if I shine a UV uh, X-ray, for example? Uh, what you're learning in your X-ray? What is it? Okay. Yes, photoionization. We call it as a photoionization. It will ionize because the energy is too great in such a way that it will you know, break, yeah, break apart, the electron will break apart. So again, this can actually provide us with another spectroscopy too, you know, because the kinetic energy emitted by this electron, I mean, of the, of the ionized electron, is actually characteristic, unique to the type of sample, the type of atom, you know, that the, the light interacts with. So again, actually, from by studying the, the kinetic energy or even the directional emission, you know, also will give us information, the directional emission of the electron. It will provide us uh, specific information regarding the chemical composition of the sample. So, so actually, uh, th th there is a lot of benefits we can, we can get from all these spectroscopy processes. So anything higher than that, like gamma ray, it will be a nuclear physics, uh, not, not spectroscopy anymore. Uh, so the highest possible is photoionization. Okay, in the spectroscopy. So uh, not only we can identify molecular species from the spectra, we can also use the spectra as a fingerprint for the molecule, no fingerprint. So all of us have a unique fingerprint. This is like a, our IC, our identity card. Before we invent the card, we actually already have a natural IC we have, okay? The fingerprint is like a unique identity. So the same goes with this spectroscopy. The spectrum that you obtain from the experiment, from the laser spectroscopy experiment, can actually be used as a fingerprint for the molecule. Even if you are not expert enough to identify which peak corresponds to what, what, what molecular species, it's okay. As long as you got the spectrum, that is the fingerprint. Yeah. So uh, I would like to end my speech, I think it's time now, by uh, giving you some, I mean, a list of more advanced topics in quantum optics. So uh, all these uh, topics, I, I just mentioned it, you know, you can go and check it out. Uh, laser cooling of atoms and molecules, you know, and ultra cold quantum gases, such as Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, intense laser interaction and propagation, 
high intensity laser is also a very uh, interesting research field. Photo ionization as well, also related to intense laser. Uh, Nonlinear and ultrafast spectroscopy. Ultrafast spectroscopy means we use a pulse laser with a very short time interval. And then we have quantum plasmonics and metamaterial. Uh, plasmonic is like the study of this uh, very small metallic nanoparticle. And metamaterial, have you heard about it? Metamaterial? Uh, no, no, uh, invisible. And you try to make things invisible. You, you watch Harry Potter? Yeah, you know Harry Potter has this invisible cloak? Yeah. The metamaterial, uh, that, that is an example of metamaterial. But that is in the fiction. You know, we want to do it in reality. We, I mean, is it successful? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so we have quantum information processing, which is a very broad subject. You know, it can be a subject itself, quantum information processing. Auto-mechanical system, like uh, auto-mechanical. So from the name automatic mechanical you can, you can guess what is auto-mechanical. Op opto means optics. Mechanical means, uh, you know, anything to do with motion. So uh, in the study of auto-mechanical system, we, we believe that this photon, when you hit a certain surface, it will have this radiation pressure. <laughs> so we're actually studying the radiation pressure, the interaction between photons, optics, and mechanical system via this uh, radiation pressure. Another one is uh, interesting phenomena, electromagnetically induced transparency, EIT. Uh, Meaning that, okay, so previously I mentioned that when you have a quantum system with transition frequency and you have a wave that matches with the frequency that matches the transition frequency exactly, what will happen is your absorption and emission will occur. Absorption will occur. So in EIT, electromagnetically induced transparency, uh, what they are trying to achieve is that they have a three level atom and they try to manipulate the atomic coherence in such a way that even if you have a matching frequency, the light will still pass through. You know? Why they do that? Because in many, in many cases, you want to use the light, but the light is absorbed and no more, attenuated. They want to retrieve the light. They cannot do it. So they, they came up with this EIT. So EIT is, is something that already exists in nature even before we, we manipulate it. So from EIT, uh, we can achieve what we call it as a lasing without inversion. You know? So if you study laser physics, you know that the prerequisite for laser to, to operate is inversion. You need to have a higher population out at the excited level and low, low, smaller population in the lower level. So what happened is that in EIT, it's possible to achieve a lasing without inversion. Even without inversion, you can still get lasing. So, of course, in EIT, another interesting phenomenon is the production of slow light and stop light. You can slow down the velocity of light, and if you can slow down, you can also stop it as well. So, yeah, so it's a phenomenon you can get from EIT, and etc. So, my, my list is not comprehensive. There are definitely more things to explore in quantum optics, and each of the topics can be a subject itself. You know? Uh, so, so I end my talk now, and thank you for coming. So, if there are any question, you can ask. Yeah, I can open the floor. Any questions? No, you can ask any questions. <laughs> yes. Oh, you, you want to have a... Do you think we should do like this or... Okay, um... <laughs> <laughs> Some of the undergraduate program, they got the quantum optics, but not for years. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I do realize that there are some universities out there that teach quantum optics, even at the undergraduate level. If it is possible, it should be taught as a final year subject, or the first year for postgraduate, mm. yeah, if it's possible. But before you understand quantum optics, you must understand quantum mechanics very well. Mm. Quantum mechanics and uh, even quantum information. No. Any other questions? So if there is a quantum optics course in this university, who is going to take it? Who is going to take it as an elective or what? Who is going to choose it? If it is a, most probably it's going to be an elective. Uh, so who is going to take it here? Only one person. <laughs> Two, three, four. Yeah, not, I have not uh, understand the subject. Really. Oh, okay. So you have not decided yet. Yeah, no.
So what happened is that uh, I'm not sure about the policy here in USM. I mean, do they allow like three students, three or four students in the class? Five, at least five. So you have, <laughs> if you want to have such a course, you, you must get at least five students, right? So if anything less than that, I think I don't think they will agree. You have to go through a lengthy procedure, opening forms and all the things. Oh, it's possible. Okay. We don't have the core subject for the fourth year. So I think maybe this one is suitable. This one is suitable. You don't have a core subject in the final year. So it's all elective, you just choose. Okay. So is there any courses that closely resemble this quantum optics? Besides quantum mechanics and atomic physics? Optics. Okay. Even optics, we just learn about the lasing action. Lasing action. Ah, and that, that, that is what you're learning in optics. <laughs> no, what, what do you expect to learn in classical optics? I'm not sure about that. The language that you speak is also uh, difficult for me to understand when I just study optics. Oh, because okay, okay. Quite, quite a level that I have to catch up. Okay, alright. Yeah, it's a common thing. It takes time actually. Time and experience. Yeah. So the main problem is that quantum mechanics is not at a level that is deep enough. Uh, until which chapter normally? You should up to hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen atoms? But it's even that chapter is skipped sometimes. Sometimes. It depends on one on the person in Oh, okay. What, what about atomic physics? Atomic physics is not a subject. So there's a paper on nucleus and atomic physics, but it's also not what at the level that is Oh. Touch and go. Okay. So the better way to introduce one object is to test all of these topics in the atomic physics. Hmm. Okay, alright. Yeah, actually we can combine it into one subject. Normally people who study quantum optics, they also study atomic physics as well. So they call it as an AMO physics, atomic molecular and optical physics. So we can actually come up with a course, AMO physics. It's possible. Yeah, but it's going to be a very broad subject then, so we need to, you know, like, I, touch and go lah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, what, what is the okay? What about the student? What is the final chapter that you learn in quantum mechanics? The final chapter, not 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 the one in the in the in the form. I mean the one that you learn in the class. We just started three chapters. We are we we haven't finished. Uh, some of the fourth year students. I'm a second year, so I just take. The last chapter is quantum harmonic oscillator. I don't think that they introduce an analytical operator and lead operator. I don't think that they introduce. Oh, so what do you learn in your harmonic oscillator? How you get, how you derive the lowest energy and how does the equation about it? Just learn about it. Oh, just learning about the equation. Oh, okay, all right, okay, all right. Anything else? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, it's not related at all. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? Uh, no, there's, there's a robotic competition actually. Yeah. Is it possible to set up a lab here to measure the optic phenomena? It seems like it's that one top experiment. Yes, it's a top, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's extremely expensive to buy the equipment. Mm. So the only way is to collaborate. Yeah. It would be good if you can set up the lab here and set up people from this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Quantum measurement? How do you see the research in quantum information in Malaysia? <laughs> research in quantum information in this country. Yeah, so uh, we do have researcher in quantum information. I think you know him, right? 
what, what is his name again? Not really in quantum information, but his student did some research in quantum information uh, in UPM, I guess. Uh, so we only can manage to do it at the theoretical level, as usual. But uh, and I, I would say <laughs> it's actually still at the very primitive area, <laughs> step, yeah, at the very primitive stage. Yeah. But when it comes to theoretical research, uh, we can actually go very far, even without funding, without the proper experimental equipment. Yeah. So we need, we need manpower, we need more people. We need students who are interested to do. And uh, I mean, to find researchers to come and teach you uh, on this area, I, I don't think it's, it's a problem. We have the contacts. It's just that we need the authority to approve, to hire them, and to pay them. Yeah. Then yeah, it's not really that difficult. Yeah, it's just that the, the, the most, the biggest issue that we face is always the lack of interest among students. Many students, or many students, uh, they either will just fall away in their undergraduate level. In their third year, they just you know don't want to have anything to do with quantum mechanics, atomic physics anymore. Or we have another problem where the students initially they, they join the the group as a master or PhD student, full of interest, and then somehow in the middle they give up. Yeah, many students give up in the middle. So that's the biggest, pro biggest problem that we face. Huh? Why is it? Why? Why is it that people stop in the middle? Many different reasons, but I, I don't know. You know, you need to ask those who quit. Mm, could be, could be, but I, I think the most, I think the most important reason is um, they have a high expectation on their supervisor. I guess they think their supervisor is going to lead them step by step and teach them everything. They think in this way. But when they enter the group, they realize that it is more like an independent study rather than. So during my time, nobody teach me what is photon anti bunching and what is this, uh, what is this and statistics. I learned all this by myself. When I was in my PhD, I just did, I, I just did my research and then I need to pick up all the fundamentals by myself. I was given a task, I need to do it. I need to complete it within a certain deadline. If I'm not able to do it, then I will, you know, yeah, something bad will happen. <laughs> yeah, that's my training. Nobody teach me anything about this photon anti bunching, Poissonian statistic. Nobody teach me anything about this. You need to pick up by yourself. So I think this this is the single most the biggest reason why people quit because it is uh, it didn't meet their expectation. They thought oh master and PhD is the undergraduate. You know you need to have a formal classroom and a study environment. You study everything step by step, and then the lecturer will teach you. You know, how to derive this, how to derive that, what does it mean, how to interpret the result. They think in this way. But it turns out that, no, everywhere you go, even outside of Malaysia, the supervisor, they don't have the time to lead, guide you step by step. They don't have the time. You need to pick up by yourself. You only ask questions when you really cannot resolve the, 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 the issue by yourself. Yeah. So how can someone able to slow down and capture the light? How can you to slow down? Slow down and capture the light. Ah, you need to study EIT, Electromagnetically Induced Transparency. Yeah, you can search on it or you can find me when you are, when you are free. Yeah. You, you know where is my, my room? 310, yeah, number 310. Maybe we'll, we'll do another... Yeah, to explain this EIT. Yeah. EIT one itself... Yeah. One second, second one. Second yeah, maybe I will talk about EIT, Electromagnetically indu Induced Transparency. It's a very interesting topic. It can be a, you know, a, a seminar itself. You can, you can make a seminar out of it. You know, to explain what is this low light and even the stop light. Yeah. The topic is quite interesting. Yeah, another topic. There are many, many more topics I can talk about. I can, I can go on like this forever. You know? Within, within uh, laser cooling of atoms and molecules, you can make a thesis out of it. You know? Uh, and then within this ultra cold quantum gases is a completely different different field of research which I'm not so familiar with. Photo ionization itself it, it can be a study, you know, it can be a subject itself. Okay, any more questions? Okay. Uh, thank you everyone. Uh,
we will have our next coffee talk about graphene uh, next Tuesday. By Dr. Yoon. Uh, Is it? A new lecturer. Also. New lecturer. Okay. She oh, okay. I, I think I, I know her. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for coming.